Thank you, Amelia. Anything more? You unmute, Prof. Good afternoon and welcome to all our viewers. Sunny Bunani, Tobela, Dumelang, Huyumirach. I wish to acknowledge this afternoon our chair of the UJ Council, Mr. Mike Teke, who also, also happens to be an astute business figure and pretty much in line with what we are going to discuss this afternoon. And uh, given his background and his industry interests, he will help us to mine wisdom this afternoon. Also, I'd like to wish with gratefulness the presence of the Vice Chancellor and his executive team, uh, our staff and students, and all the friends of UJ. My name is Daniel van Lil, and I serve as the Executive Dean of the UJ College of Business and Economics. So welcome at this book discussion in the series where uh, Mike will introduce us to books that are both informative and inspiring. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, Mr. Teke is a renowned business leader and as a member of the, the UJ College of Business and Economics, I surely appreciate his business savvy, but what I really, really enjoy is when he adds his perspective as a human being. The book that, that Mike has chosen for our session this afternoon was authored by Christian Correra and is titled Dream Big. And in essence, about, it is about how the Brazilian trio uh, behind 3G Capital, and um, they will be introduced in the course of the conversation, acquired Anheuser Busch, Burger King, and Heinz. Now, it's, it's a fascinating story, a narrative, because uh, 3G is actually a global investment firm located in Latin America, and they have a very strong history of operational excellence and board involvement and deep sector expertise and an extensive global network. So uh, they focus in essence on long-term uh, growth of value and the maximizing of the potential of the brands that they acquire. Now, the interesting thing is the companies that have actually bought, acquired, over the years includes Burger King, which I think we are all familiar with here locally. And then the Anheuser Busch companies, which is the world's largest beer brewing company, uh, headquartered in St. Louis in, in Missouri. And then Heinz is also a brand that we are familiar with locally. Um, when you just think about when you buy tomato sauce off any shelf, um, and they are a food processing company manufacturing thousands of food products across six continents and over 200 countries. So how on earth did they achieve this great accomplishment? Um, so um, what really got me in this book, and Mr. I just shared this with Mr. Teke, was the foreword was written by Jim Collins, which is a book published quite a couple of years ago that had a huge impact on the way that I think about sustainability. And the book's uh, name was From Good to Great. And uh, in the foreword in the book that Mr. Teke will introduce today and discuss is um, uh, George uh, Paolo Lehmann stating that in the end, I'm a teacher. And that is really how I see myself. And when I saw that line, I've just read the whole book. And uh, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. So uh, the way in which we will proceed today is that Mr. Tech is going to open the floor with his observations, and then we'll open for uh, questions and answers. And we would like to really encourage you to add your questions in the Q and A uh, se section on 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 uh, Zoom. And uh, whenever you wish, I will keep an eye on it, 
and we will attend to your questions in the second half of the session. So, Mike, once again, wonderful to see the Chair of Council and the Vice Chancellor here this afternoon. A warm welcome to you. Um, I think it's really leadership here by example, as far as I'm concerned. And I now hand over to you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks, Prof. Van Lin. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for arranging this session. And uh, I'm grateful that Prof. Marala and uh, the library team, you haven't decided to fire me yet. I haven't received my letter that I'm fired. I enjoy these book reviews. And I continue to select books based on my experiences and what I'm seeing every day in our lives. Today, I decided that I'll do a book review on a book called Dream Big, a book authored by Christian Correa. And uh, firstly, I do not believe that people like uh, Jorge Paul, Paolo Lemon, and uh, Carlos Alberto Sicupira, and Herman Marcel tell us would have written a book themselves. So this was authored after quite a number of people were interviewed about the life of these three great individuals. The second attraction for me is that these three individuals have become global players in an environment that is interestingly unusual in, the way, in this way that if you look at a country like Brazil with a smaller GDP to that of the United States, and you find three individuals who do their best to buy companies, turn them around in any jurisdiction. Now, I, we operate in South Africa. We have quite a number of issues that we grapple with every day, with issues like if you were to build a company in South Africa, we tend to develop an attitude that says our businesses end up in South Africa. You don't want to expand beyond the borders of South Africa. Whilst we find things like concepts like black economic empowerment working very well in many instances, helping quite a number of people, creating wealthy people, but we need to reach a stage where we behave like those three individuals because there are great lessons to learn out of them. So Jorge Paulo Lehman, growing up in Brazil with his parents who came from Switzerland, migrated to Brazil, he grows up as a tennis player. He meets up with Alberto Carlos Sicupira. In the book, you will hear about Beto Sicupira. Probably they cut the name Alberto and they call him Beto Sicupira. He's the second important person in this group. The third one is Marcel Herman Marcel Tellers. These three individuals, they are bright, they are highly educated and they understand the world of business. Now for me, the greatest lesson starts there. I know quite a number of people would say, why did you choose this book? And you'll realize as I go through this book that my reflection is important that these three individuals come from a country called Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, they operate there. They operate an investment business, they operate a bank, they operate Garantia. They have their experiences in building this business. And as they start operating this business, they, 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 there are times where they make mistakes, they lose money. There are times where they operate businesses, they make money. But when this book ends, it ends at a stage where some of the transactions were not mentioned, and I'll talk about those later. You are talking about effectively a business that's worth 160 billion US dollars. Let me talk about two scholars here, Jim Collins, Jim Collins and a professor by the name of Vincente Falcone. Jim Collins wrote the foreword to this book because when George A. Paolo Lehman was attending a class which was given by Jim Collins, they had a debate in class when they were talking about Mr. Sam Walton. Mr. Sam Walton is the man who built Walmart in the US. And it so happened that George Paolo Lehman knew Sam Walton. And in the debating class, he mentions to Jim Collins that 
In fact, Sam Walton, uh, Walton was not a clock teller, he was a clock builder. He was simple, he just built a great, powerful business. We know that Walmart in South Africa, they now own macro, but globally they are a big, big retail business. These three individuals, the interesting point about them is they embrace certain principles. The principles for me are important for all of us in our business, the business that I run, I have three principles that we embrace in our business. And I do my best that I become exhaustive about selling them to everybody who joins our business. Even the lowest employee in the business, when I say lowest in terms of either level and the like, we make sure that we sell those principles. These people were driven by a simple principle of meritocracy. Merit, merit, merit. Pay people well, make them create wealth, wealth, make them rich, and let them be successful. And that is why Jim Collins talks about George Paolo Lehman as a teacher. That at the end of the day, this man is a teacher. If one day you have time on YouTube, listen to the interview between Jim Collins and George Paolo Lehman. It comes up that the relationship between the two people becomes so strong that Jim Collins every year takes the team from the companies owned by these three people to their to his retreat in Boulders in Colorado. And they go there and they talk about business to hone their skills, not to believe that they know everything. So Jim Collins plays an important role in their lives. And you know, Jim Collins is the author of great books like Good to Great, Built to Last. Now, where does Paolo Vincente Falcone come in? Professor Vincente Falcone comes in when he was recruited to help them improve their systems in all the businesses that they took over. And never underestimate the power of meritocracy, never underestimate the power of simplicity, never underestimate the power of, when you buy a business, you're buying a people machine. That's what Jim Collins talks about. But these three individuals were relentless in their approach to building a great empire. I know quite a number of people in this, in this conversation will say, we're not capitalists, we're not interested in money, but let's take the lessons, let's focus on the lessons. All of the people who went through the system, all the people who went through the system of joining 3G Capital, whether it was earlier in their lives, all of them were people who were called PSDs. PSD. Poor, smart, desire to be rich, deep desire to be rich. Poor, smart, and a deep desire to be rich. Work hard, be smart. When you say poor, it's people who came into this business, probably they never inherited anything or they never had anything. And I know people can argue that George Paolo Lehman came, came from an, 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 a, a background of traders. His family was, they were in trading, they were involved in a cheese making business in Switzerland. And when they left and when he came back, which is where he is now, he lives between Brazil and Switzerland. George Paolo Lehman, uh, uh, Alberto Carlos de Cupira, Herman, Teles, uh, Herman Marcelo, Tello, Mar Marcelo Teles, the three individuals have a journey. They took a journey of identifying businesses that they could buy, go in, turn them around. If you're not in business today, you will understand that you are either in an NGO or you run a private organization or there are things that have to be turned around to make them super efficient. When you run your family, you have children, you have a family, I'm not saying don't run it like a business, I'm not saying that, I'm saying there are principles that you develop to have an efficient, well-managed, well-led business. In other words, you have tranquility and everything runs in order. My son tells me that if I talk about things like that, it sounds boring. So these gentlemen identified a business called Lojas Americano, which is a retail business in Brazil, and they buy this business. And buying this business, what do they do? They identify one of their people there. And they asked Beto Sikupira 
to take over this business, to go and run this business and turn it around with the principles that they had identified, that they found to be working in every business sphere of their lives. Now, if you look at these three individuals, Beto Kupira, he's seen as one of those people who's ruthless, cold, goes into a business and he implements what he has to implement and the business turns around, it becomes profitable and successful. Why? Because they believe in those specific principles. In fact, they make a comment. They say, we are a one-trick pony. We employ people, we give them our management system, they go into a company, they turn the business around using those principles. What principles are those? The principles of meritocracy, high performance, simplicity. Yes, their businesses were not driven by diversity. And which is a negative for me because you'd like to bring in diversity. You like the gender mix. You like to bring in women into the business. You like, in their case, their belief system at the time, they focused on that system and they say, we, we accept, we are a one trip pony. They become successful with Lojas Americana, which was competing with companies like Walmart because they were in the retail space. What does Alberto Cupira does, which is Beto? He makes sure that he drives that performance structure within that organization. Then they identify their second target. Their second target is a company called Brema. It's a brewery in Brazil. And they targeted to this business. They said, we want to buy Brema. We want to run Brema. And we will send somebody into that company and we're going to turn it around. Again, we know that we're talking about the principles they've established, which I've spoken about. The principles of identifying smart people, bringing them in and ensuring that they, they drive meritocracy, they pay them well, they look after those people. And they send Marcelo Tellos to go and run Brema. What does he do? He goes in there, he drives the same principles, the same principles that 3G Capital is known for. We know that in Brazil, Brema was competing with Antarctica. They were competing with Bavaria, which was in Colombia. And these were smaller. They were competing with Moderna, who were owning uh, another brewery in Mexico. There was a time when Brema, because they wanted to expand, they nearly bought uh, uh, Bavaria in Colombia, but they decided not to. What happens as you run a business like that? It has happened in my life where you have an appetite to want to grow the business. Growth becomes a phenomenon in your life. Growth becomes the drug. Growth becomes Growth becomes part of your, your DNA. You, you develop that, you become an adrenaline junkie because you want to grow, you want to be big. And growth comes with its size, its stature, its more value, its shareholder returns. And it's about making sure that you grow the talent that you have. And one day, Marcelo Tellez is sitting in a room with one of his colleagues, Rodriguez, and they say, what about us buying Antarctica? It's like sitting in a room in South Africa and uh, it has happened in the past. I'm sure you know the history. There was a time where NetBank and Standard Bank nearly matched at some stage. We know that one Saturday afternoon in South Africa, a gentleman by the name of Bernard Swanepoel wrote a letter to a gentleman who was the CEO of Goldfields, Mr. Ian Cockrell, and said, I want to take over Goldfields. Harmony was taking over Goldfields. We know that there was a time when BHP, the Australian conglomerate, was merging with Billiton to create BHP Billiton, and today we have a global player called BHP. Now here is Brema in Brazil. It goes to Antarctica, Antarctica in Brazil, and they want to match these two businesses. And the competition authorities didn't want to hear anything about it. 
there was a company in Brazil by the name of Kaiser. Kaiser was a distributor of Coca-Cola products. They wanted to block the transaction. What I'm sharing with you, the lessons of simplicity, the lessons of hard work, the lessons of meritocracy come out when the Bremer team led by Telus, who in that journey picked up an illness, but they were relentless in ensuring that they get Antarctica. And that was called the Dream Project. The Dream Project, because of its size, because of the stature of the, of the transaction in Brazil, and a big brewing company called Ambev was created. That shows to all of us here that no mountain is too big. Again, they go into this organization that has got old people who don't want to change, who are losing money, who are losing market chain Antarctica. They bring these, trans, these, these two businesses together. Who prevails? 3G Capital, the three gentlemen prevail with their tricks. One trick pony, they are, they've got one trick. Take good people, bring them into the organization, pay them well, meritocracy, pay them on merit, don't pay them on how long they've been in an organization, allow them to develop the business. Simplicity, cut costs. Beto C. Kupira says, costs are like nails. When they grow, you cut them. Now they move on because their art is insatiable. They look at themselves as embedded in South America. The lesson for us as South Africans, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have seen it in South Africa. We've seen it with quite a number of organizations that have left the shores of South Africa, small country and they captured the world. And I'll talk to you about those organizations in South Africa. These three gentlemen decide that there is a company in the United States of America called Anhauser Fitch. They own a brand called Budweiser. And when they told the American lawyers one day that we are interested in this, <clears throat> they could see that these American lawyers were creating and becoming uncomfortable. That who are you to try and think you can buy an asset like that, a brand like that, that is really American? A B in Ambev, Ambev, A M B V, A M B E V ventures into the European market in Belgium to go and buy a business called Interbrew that was owned by three families. The interest at the time was to say, there is a company called Interbrew. They own beautiful brands like Stella Artois. I wish I drank beer, probably I'll tell you how it tastes, but I can't. The three families, the Van Damme family, Mavia's family, and the Spielberg family decide to work with these InBev people to create AB InBev. <coughs> AB InBev is created and it becomes a Belgian company. It, it, it stays in Belgium. And having stayed in Belgium, the next venture in the beer fight they go for, Anhauser Busch, which is Budweiser. That's why you ended up with a company called AB InBev. Who owns that company? Who are the majority controllers of that company? The three, the trio. From Brazil, South America. They've now captured the first brand in the United States of America. We know how Americans are with their brands. They love them. They protect them. They look after them. McDonald's is American. Apple is American. Microsoft is American. Budweiser was American. What do they do next? In the book, you don't pick up the story, but let me finish the brewery story. When they created AB InBev, they ended up coming to South Africa to take our jewel, which was called South African Breweries. We know that they, SAB bought Miller to create the second biggest. And they went for the second biggest, these people, globally. And today, AB InBev is the biggest brewer in the world. And they bought South African breweries. So they took 
Bremer, Bremer, Antarctica, Inbev, Anhauser Bush, SAB, which included Miller. So it's six businesses into one. Drive meritocracy, drive hard work, bring in young people to run the business with you, make sure that you stay out of it. I'll tell you this about the CEOs that they employ, how they employ them. <clears throat> then they go and buy Burger King. It's another second American brand that is big, that is powerful. And they decide to go to the third brand. Which one? Heinz. Ketchup. We call it tomato sauce in South Africa. But here's an interesting leadership story, ladies and gentlemen, which is a big lesson for all of us in the world. We shouldn't forget. And I want to start talking to you about people have a view that says these three individuals did not drive succession, which I disagree with. They drove succession very well. So let me tell you a story. Who was the CEO of AB InBev when they took over SA Breweries, the last previous CEO? It's a gentleman by the name of Carlos Brito. How did they employ Carlos Brito? They didn't go out in the market and recruit Carlos Brito. You grow your own timber. Grow your own timber. Carlos Brito gets introduced to uh, George Paolo Neyman by somebody. Carlos Brito was a student studying, was a working, he was employed by Mercedes Benz. He's an engineer. But Carlos Brito wants to do an MBA. He wants to go to Stanford in the US and he doesn't have the money. He goes to George Paolo Lehman, he gets introduced to him and he tells him the story that I want to go and do an MBA. I don't have the money. I'm going to, how, what, what do I do? George Paolo Lehman says, I'll give you the money to go to study the MBA. But for, there are three conditions. One, you keep me updated. Two, any article that has to do with finance, send it to me. Number three, when you come back, you're going to help other people like I helped you. That's how the Estudia Foundation was created by George Paolo Lehman. They build foundations. As soon as you make lots of money, build a foundation to help other people, help other people, empower other people. Don't kick the ladder. Let other people climb the ladder with you. But understand something, this is the rule from me. Nobody has ever climbed a ladder from the top. It's impossible. You can only climb the ladder from the bottom. So Carlos Brito goes to Stanford, he does his MBA, he comes back. Listen to this. He gets a job offer, $90,000 a year from McKinsey and Company. He goes back to George Paolo, George Paolo says, I'll employ you, but I'll give you $22,000 a year. Which job would you take? You would have gone to McKinsey because it's a lot of money, but he went because this is the man who helped me to get my MBA. And Carlos Brito becomes the CEO of AB InBev and the man who built that empire. He's retired now, he's 63. He's worth probably $600 million. That's how you grow your own team, but that's how you support others. Let me talk to you about the second individuals by the name of Carlos Nevis. They took this young man. He wanted to do an MBA in Illinois, in Chicago. And he was taken into Bremer after completing his MBA. Same route, same conversation, same request. The best one is a gentleman by the name of Bernardo Hiss. Bernardo Hiss is the CEO, he's sitting now in Miami. At the age of 42, he became the CEO of Burger King. They put in their people in those organizations. They say, you go in there, here's our recipe, our management system of meritocracy, simplicity, cut costs, be efficient, build this business. Bernardo Hiss was to see ben Bert Bertos Sikupira. We remember, Carlos Brito was helped by George Paolo Neyman. Now this time, Bernardo Hiss goes to Beto Sikupira and he says to him, I want to do an MBA, I need help, I need money. And uh, Beto Sikupira says to him, 
I won't give you my money. I'll give you my money. You want to spend my money with your girlfriends, on girlfriends. And this young man says to him, no, I am going to pay for my fees. But if there's the money left, yes, I'll spend it with my girlfriends. And this young man got his MBA at Warwick in England, comes back, they made him the CEO of Burger King. The fourth one is Alexander Berling. Alexander Berling did an MBA at Harvard. They paid for him, they supported him. They've built a business, they've built an empire behind the same principles, the principles that show you how sim simplicity works, how meritocracy works, how efficiencies work. And they listen to these professors who are helping them. They always go to Jim Collins, not for the, him to run the businesses for them. They always use Professor Vincente Falcone. Professor Vincente Falcone is behind the systems that these people put in place. They are a one trick pony, but these businesses work. George A. Paolo Neyman is a friend of Warren Buffett. When they were doing the Heinz transaction, they went to Warren Buffett, they worked with Warren Buffett, 3G Capital, and Warren Buffett bought Heinz. You know, at the end of the book, there is a conversation that takes place where a question is asked to Warren Buffett and this gentleman as to whether will you one day take over Coca-Cola? And nobody answers that question. I think we should watch the space. One day something like that will happen. Now, let's talk about their personalities. We said to you, if you look at George Paolo Lehman, a billionaire, one day his wife in Switzerland was having breakfast. She overheard a conversation on the radio. They were talking about the second richest person in Switzerland, George Paolo Lehman. He's second to the man who controls IKEA, the furniture business. And the wife was surprised because he doesn't behave like a wealthy man. He just keeps his life simple. And Jim Collins says, this is a role model. He's a magnet that elevates. His people are attracted to him. He builds a network. People like him. When they are attracted to him, he grows them and he elevates them. He's never greedy. The second one <coughs> in this team is Pedro Sicupira, Carlos Alberto Sicupira. He's known as undiplomatic. They call him the bulldozer, self-righteous, and a mercurial temperament that he's got. This is the man who walked into Lojas Americano and turned things around. Why? Because he's the bulldozer. The first person is your teacher, he's your educator, he's the man who will groom you, he's the man who likes a network, but the business principles are the principles that they've agreed. Then you've got Teles Marcelo. And Marcelo Tellers, introspective, studious, he loves poetry and painting and the like. They make a comment, they say that they the CEO of Antarctica, the brewery they, they matched with in Brazil and Bremer matched. On the day of the announcement, they arrived at the announcement. It was interesting that the CEO of uh, Antarctica was wearing a suit and a tie. He was very formal and very scholarly. As usual, Marcelo Teles was wearing his jeans. I'm not saying people should be, uh, uh, I mention it all the time that be presentable, make sure that you dress properly, but it's the formal and the informal side of these groupings of people. And when they walk into a business, it's to drive that principle that those principles that we developed over a period of time. If you start the book and read the book in this beginning, they give you the 10 principles, 10. And they talk about those principles that these are the principles that have built these businesses. This is how we have built these businesses. And I just want to touch on a few. One, always invest in people. And I gave you examples of what happened with Carlos Brito, Bernardo uh, he is 
Carlos Neves, the young people they brought into the business. That is very important. We tend to be greedy and forget that we will recruit people. Groom people internally. Look at the talent that's in the organization. I have a story that I tell in my businesses where I work. I always say to people, I'm, a, I'm short in terms of height. And I struggle, I don't want to employ short people. I want taller people, taller than me. Because if the light bulb has to be changed and we're all short, there's no one who's going to be able to change the light bulb. I'm sure you understand that analogy. The second one is sustain momentum with a big dream. The dream for Braema to take over Antarctica, it was called the dream project. You dream big, you dream of big things. The third principle they talk about is create meritocratic ownership culture, which, which is aligned with aligned incentives. Incentivize people, make sure that when people are wealthy, when people have made money, and now I'm talking business to university people, I'm talking about money. At the end of the day, people start to focus on their jobs. They don't worry about anything, but they worry about their roles because there's merit. You can export a great culture across widely divergent industries and geographies. These guys have proved that from Brazil to Europe to the US, and they've conquered big organizations, it's easy to export great culture. A great culture of meritocracy, a great culture of hard work, great culture of being smart. Five, focus on creating something great, not on managing money. Stop worrying about managing money. Just focus on building something that is really great. Six, for me, if you wake me up at 2 a.m., there are three principles in our business. Simplicity, intensity, consistency. Simple. Don't ask me about vision, mission in my business. I don't know that. Simple things work. Intensity works. You intensify anything you do. Results you chase all the time and you become consistent. Consistent. People know that you are predictably consistent on things. And these guys believed in simplicity has genius and magic in it. And they say, it's okay to be a fanatic. It's okay to be a fanatic. Discipline and calm, not speed, is the key to success. And number nine, a strong and disciplined board of directors. Because at times you find that you cannot control your board of directors because they are powerful, in it. but make sure that it's a strong group of people. Don't ever employ yes men or yes women. Bring talented people, drive meritocracy, make sure you deliver that, that principle. And the last one, seek mentors and teachers and connect them together. That is why Jim Collins has made it part of his life to bring this team from 3G Capital every year to Colorado in the boulders. Is there any business in South Africa that comes to UJ Professor Van Lille and say, can we come and spend a, a day or a week with you just to hone our principles, our structures, our systems? No, we need to start sharing such things. They've got Professor Vincent de Falcone, who has made it a point that he drives data, he drives systems, he helps them in every business they have. Today, you have these wealthy people, it's not about wealth only. They are running successful foundations. They run the Estudia foundations and Lehman has got his own foundation. Beto Sikupira has his own foundation. And Marcelo Tellers has his own foundation. To balance things out, not in spending money with other people, but spending money in those things that will make society better. And my choice for this book, ladies and gentlemen, was purely based on the principle that says, as we grow, as we lift each other up, a young man knocks at your office and says to you, I've got, I want to be a chartered accountant. I've got a young lady who came to my office, bold. I want to be a CA. She was 17. She came from Mafiqueng. I want to be a CA. And today she's a CA. She's at one of the investment banks. I met a young lady from my township, Guatemala. She said to me, 
one of my dreams is to be big, but I want to be a medical doctor. And she's in her third year, the now she's doing her medical degree. I met a young lady who comes from Western area, Western area. Some of these towns are not known to quite a number of people. And she's doing her third year, electrical engineering at VETS. Those three ladies, I believe they are going to change something. And it's that principle called one starfish at the time, throw it back to the sea, one starfish at the time. And that's what the 3G capital people have done as they build these brands. Today, as I sit here, if I said to you, three Brazilians from Rio de Janeiro would own three powerful US brands, Budweiser, it's a beer, Vega King, which competes with the McDonald's of this world and the like, and Heinz. You know, when you go to America, everybody wants ketchup. And that is why there's a question going around, what's next? Are they going for Pepsi, PepsiCo or are they going for Coca-Cola? And Warren Buffett, at the end of the book, he says, I'm not going to give you the answer to that question. Ladies and gentlemen, I liked this book and I believe for young people, it's going to, if you read this book, it will make sure that you do two things. They say you have the knife in between your teeth or fire in your eyes. You're hungry, you want to make things happen. Whether you are at a university as a professor, Prof. Marwala, I know we are on a journey, me and you, to make this university called University of Johannesburg the best globally. And we're going to do it, me and you, together. Not unless you fire me. Because I know we've got it in ourselves. We're going to build powerful things. And that is why I want us to read this book and listen to the story of these three gentlemen. They came from humble beginnings. They don't forget about it. And one way, be a one trip pony, Follow those principles. And you'll build something powerful. Let me stop there. Questions, comments. Thank you, Mr. Teke. This was now really great. And I think right through your entire presentation, I couldn't rem uh, but remind myself of Jim Collins's uh, three steps in you know building a great organization. And it starts with getting with disciplined people. And it says that you need to get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and the right people in the right seats. So, uh, and, and, and it's fantastic to know that the chair of the UJ Council has emphasized the human element right through this, uh, through your entire discussion. I see here uh, that we've got uh, six interesting questions here, and I've kind of grouped them together. So let's see how, what your response would be. Uh, the first one was pretty much relevant to uh, the current situation in the country. And the question was, how can we apply the wisdom of G3 capital in getting the, our, our economy going again? You know, we are an interesting country. We were, we're a country with resources on the ground. I'm talking about mineral resources. We are a country with great agricultural potential. We've got farming, we grow anything in this country. Citrus, we grow grapes, we grow. We've got, yeah, people say our rain, is, our rain season is not the greatest, but we do get water. We have, we can do something with water. We have the greatest asset this country, in this country. It's called people. If we can drive a principle, me, if I were to sit down and look at the country and say, with all those ingredients on the table, we need to start driving the principle of can-do attitude. I believe, and I might be wrong, I think we talk too much. We're too political, we're too policy driven. We need to start driving the can-do spirit of making things happen. We need to drive youth, the young people. We need to start investing in those young people. And I think policy, red tape, we need to change from the red tape to what we call smart tape. The red tape, we know what it is. It's policy, follow this, follow this, follow this, follow this, fill this paper and go to the ninth floor, come back, let it be stamped in rubber stamp. 
we need to start saying minimize policy usage, the can do spirit of let's help the young people identify opportunities. Why would a person like Elon Musk leave South Africa to go to the US? Probabilities are that it's a question of let's try and relax our bureaucrats. We remember the CADE in Brazil when Arctica was going to merge with Prema. They said, this is going to be too big. We're not going to allow it. This measure cannot go through. They dealt with that easily to say, it's business, let's grow businesses. We need to simplify our policies as a country. And we need to drive a certain principle of, ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you something and you can debate it with me. A strong work ethic pays off. Anyway, a strong work. I know people would say you must work smart. No, don't come with an excuse of being lazy. Hard work. A strong work ethic of making things happen. Those ingredients I spoke about will yield results. We've got mineral resources. There are countries without mineral resources. Singapore don't have a single mine. We've got a great economy. We've got agriculture. We've got water. We have land all over the place, and we have you, you. We're spending time on policy, we're spending time on politics, we're spending time on wrong things. Simple, simplify policy, no red tape, smart tape, and a strong like ethic. <clears throat> Thank you. Here's an interesting, two interesting questions from students, I think. Um, the, the first question is about whether you should, uh, whether it's worthwhile pursuing an MBA in order to become a CEO one day. And uh, there's also another counter question who suggests that you need to be a CA in order to become a CEO. What are your views? So history has it that there was a period in our lives, years back, and guys, life has got its uh, uh, periods. You remember there was a time when people were called certain groups of people you used to grow your hair and they were called certain things changed, fashion changed. There were times in business where everybody had to have an MBA. For you to grow in the business, you had to sit in a boardroom with equals, you had to have an MBA. When I worked for a German company called Bayer, I had to go and do an MBA. I felt strong that if you don't have an MBA, a master's in business administration, it moves everything together. You start to understand business. That has changed. An MBA is important, but not, not critical for now. What I mean, if you want to do an MBA, it doesn't mean therefore you have a ticket to become a CEO, because I don't want you to be disappointed. Then there was a time when the JSE, in most cases, people were starting to say, if you want to be a CEO, you must be a CA, chartered accountant. We have discovered that some of the bright CEOs underlying, some of the bright CEOs, are those CEOs who came from the humanities, who came from the social sciences. Prof. Marwala has a story he tells that when he was studying engineering in the US, he had to identify courses and he ended up doing dancing and ballet or something like that, because you have to blend and mix those things. We don't want to sit in a boardroom with somebody with a very high IQ, but mm. low EQ. You deal with human beings. So an MBA, yes, do it, it's important, but don't ever raise your own expectations thinking that just because I've got an MBA, I'll sit back and the MBA will open the doors for me to be a CEO. No, a great work ethic. If there's one thing Prof. Van Lille I cried about in my life as my tech, I work 24-7, I run a lot of business, lots of businesses, but I still have time where I'd like you, Prof. Van Lille, and the university to challenge me in lecturing on a great work ethic, coming to lecture at the university and talking about a great work ethic. So to have an MBA, it's important, but it's not going to make you a CEO if you're not, you don't have it in you to be a CEO. Secondly, there was a story that if you are a CA, therefore you are going to be a CEO, inevitably. Thank you. And uh, believe me, that challenge is certainly accepted. Um, so the third one is more at a personal level. 
you spoke a lot about a big dream this afternoon. So one of our participants wants to know, Mike Teke, what is your big dream? And to make that dream realize, you have to be disciplined. How do you keep your routine? You know, I'm an orphan, brother, and I don't like shouting about that. I know, I know a lot of people find it boring. I know my mother died when I was a little boy, and I never had a father. My grandmother was a disciplinarian. She was tough, 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 but in a positive way. And she inculcated a spirit in me, a spirit of consistency. If you find me at a specific time in the morning, you will find me. And if you know the team that I work with, they know what time I phone them. I phone people at a specific time, not five o'clock, but early in the morning, I will catch you. And I send my emails, messages for the day, what we need to drive and achieve. What is it that we're going to drive? I, I work hard, I'm a workaholic. And I know people talk to me about work-life balance. I try. I know that it's, it impacts on your health. I know one day this body will get tired, but I'm driven by a heavy work ethic. I'm driven by discipline. I'm driven by making things happen. What is my dream? I grew up in a family of 20, 25 people. We, were, we faced poverty. It was tough. My grandmother struggled tough. I didn't have the best of education. I went to a public school. My dream is to build unashamedly strong and big empire, a business that is diversified into different sectors. I'm on that journey and it's going to happen and it is happening and nothing is going to stop me. I'm not being arrogant about it. I'm humble about it, but I'm just, what I'm explaining to you, answering your question, my dream is to build an empire that's going to benefit this country, that benefits sub-Saharan Africa, Africa, and the whole world. And I want to make a difference in people's lives. Thank you. And th thank you for that inspiring passion. The next one is about these, uh, about 3G, having built an internationally renowned company with major brands and having a massive footprint. So Molly asks, um, how do we expand beyond South African borders, whether it be corporate business, NGOs, institutions, doesn't matter. How do we get beyond that mindset of the border is the limit? So <clears throat> historically, we know what happened with South African breweries, and then the name will give it to you, South African breweries. At that time, Maya, Mr. Maya Khan and the late, uh, uh, the late CEO who built uh, SAB and took it to the UK and listed and had a dual listing in the UK. When you look at how SAB was built, they started buying breweries outside the borders of South Africa and they ended up buying Miller in the US and they ended up becoming SAB, SAB Miller. Now, they could have had a mindset or trapped in that paradigm that we are South African breweries. We end up here, it's Castle Lager, it's Black Label, it's Castle Stout, Milk Stout, and that's it. And the market is this. They build that business. <coughs> when AB InBev was number one, <coughs> SAB Miller was number two. We build it. There was a time when Old Mutual was conquering the world. Anglo-American, Billiton. <coughs> Sorry. There was a time hmm. when CEOs of the four biggest mining companies in the world were South Africans. When BHP Billiton was led by Marius Klopas, the South African. When Glencoe, Ivan Klassenbeck, a vets man, South African. When Rio Tinto, the chairman, was a South African, said to play C. When Anglo American was a South African company, had Tony Trayer. We have it in us as South Africans. How do we do it? We need to break the mindset by identifying opportunities beyond the borders of South Africa. And I want to touch on another important point whilst we're on this subject. When you look at black economic empowerment, which has benefited a lot, which has created wealthy people, which is a policy that is meant to redress the imbalances of the past. 
we should not confine ourselves to say we build a company in South Africa, it's PEE, therefore it ends here. It's time that we look beyond our borders and say, where can we expand? How do we end foreign currency? How do we diversify into other markets? I'm yet to see, I am going to see it, we are going to see a black South African company and black entrepreneurs, quite a number of them soon, between now and 2030, we will go out and conquer the world because that mindset is breaking. It is happening and we're going to see it. How we do it is that can do attitude and a great work ethic and being business savvy. Thank you. And here's, here's a very interesting uh, question from a student regarding the University of Johannesburg. Um, and you can hear this is a, when I read this, I just felt my orange blood <laughs> flowing quickly. Um, the question is, how do you think can we build UJ as a university that, that can thrive far beyond any individual leader? Well, number one, it's called the University of Johannesburg. And the first thing, Prof. Marwala and I, we shouldn't confine ourselves to Johannesburg. So had it not been for Corona, Prof. Marwala and I, and I'll reveal some secrets here, Prof. Marwala, if you shoot me, that's fine. I always, I always say to people, I make mistakes and then I apologize rather than not making mistakes. So it's better that I'll apologize if I made a mistake. So Prof. Marwala and I were planning a trip to go to the US. And we we're planning to meet with big business in the US to build an endowment, not to a cap in hand, but to take this brand and build links with countries like the US, countries like China. If you read uh, the governance of China, Xi Jinping talking about uh, big rivers don't refuse any stream. I wanted us to infuse ourselves with these other big countries and build relationships, A, to take the brands to the other countries, two, to have a lot of international students coming to study here. Prof. Marola talks by Africa by bus. I would have liked us to drive that Africa by bus concept big to take our students to other countries. Four, I'm tired of reading in a newspaper in the rankings that you have every time, Harvard, Cambridge, Stanford, we need to take a South African university closer to that level in terms of rankings. Am I dreaming big? Yes. Am I schizophrenic? No. I believe this dream can be achieved and we are going to take this university there. Not unless I get fired tomorrow by Prof Marwala, but this leadership will do it. You know, it's interesting. I always observe uh, at, at any sports game, especially the Olympic, there's a podium with place for three people and the best one stands at the top, the rest plays on the lawn. But anyway, so here's a, here's a very practical question. Uh, this question is uh, from Safisu, and he's from Kwatemba. <clears throat> he says, you know what? Uh, throwing money at a new small business isn't the real solution. In we small business. business. Yes. Um, and I think he's kind of, I get the sense of helicopter money here. Uh, because the funding that is currently available doesn't always reach the do real uh, bring about real changes. So, so he asked his question is where do we start? And uh, now this is a nice one, which we maybe perhaps can jointly do something about. Are you able to be a mentor? You know, <clears throat> where do you start? And it's a good point that he's making. You know, finding a mentor is a great story. I have a lot of people who ask me to mentor them, but most of them, a number of them are lazy, lazy. They see you once and they disappear because you tell them the truth. And then you have, in a group of 20, you're left with two or three who are hungry, who are disciplined, who want to make things happen. I always say to people, I will mentor you, but make sure that you stick to the recipe that we're going to agree. And I'll tell you, Prof. Van Lin, we meet once, we meet twice. After the third meeting, they don't come back because they notice that this thing is not easy. And I can't, I'm not going to give people freebies. I don't have them. But I give you the skill, the recipe that's going to make you a wealth beater, make a difference in life. It's interesting. I'd like to respond to that because my, my, my experience is that 
uh, really good business people are incredibly busy people. And they But are, if you want an assignment to be done, give it to a busy person. Uh -huh. Exactly. But the key thing is business folks and well, people who are successful are normally very skilled in, the, in, in problem solving. And a mentorship session is not a therapy session yet. No. Uh, it's about asking questions and mining truth that you can apply and adapt in your own life. And if that exactly. part of the conversation is not there, I kind of normally say, okay, let's have a nice day, have some tea and bugger off. Uh, sorry, I mean, uh, let's, let's uh, take our separate roads. But Sviso, um, I'll help you. Ah, good. And I think um, I want to take this one up. Um, there's one more question here, and we are kind of actually now, it's now 15.30. So let me make this the last one, and then we can conclude. And, and this is uh, from a student here I see in public management and governance. I recognize the surname. Um, and the question is, how do we transform the public sector? How do we get really talented people within the public sector who can strengthen the governance backbone of our country? Number one, meritocracy, merit. You must drive merit. Number two, we need to remove the mindset that I work for the government or I work for an SOE. That mindset is the mindset that says, just because I work for a government or meritocracy, I don't think the government can go bankrupt. We need to start driving those two principles. The last big one, people should not worry about watching the clock. People should worry about delivery on goals and targets. You worry about my office is closing at three. I will see you tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. So those three principles, meritocracy, getting the task and removing the mindset. We've got a wrong mindset. It's not going to go anywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Tech, I'd like to say thank you very much for this. Uh, it's always- Thank you. Conversation is one of the values of UJ. And this conversation, again, meant a lot of, to me because it, it reconfirmed uh, things for me and it also strengthened uh, what I still have to learn. And thank you very much for sharing those insights with us and, and actually, you know, adding that real passion to, to this. I'd like to try to summarize what we've uh, heard this afternoon in five points. And I always think the almighty gave us five fingers because I can only remember five things at a time. So I think the, the first one was about people. And I think um, the note that I've made here in my little blue book, that's kind of my, actually my, my idea of a hard drive, um, to really, it's better to give talented people a chance and let them make and learn from their mistakes than not to believe in people. That is a pretty important one. And the second one was about that you sustain your big dream, uh, the UJ ideal in, in, in our context, uh, with the dream itself, the people that you've got in a culture of meritocracy. Uh, you reward sensible and constructive behavior. And you draw a very clear line in the sand on that matter. The third one is that, and this is one of the questions that were posed to you, that a great organizational culture can be exported. And that means that the UJ brand can go far beyond the borders of our country into our continent and beyond. Um, and that for me is pretty inspirational. Then you've mentioned in the book, uh, emphasis was placed on simplicity. You've added two words there as well that I kind of made a note here in my little blue book, intensity and consistency. And that so for me relies, relates to, you know, agility and, and how the whole branding and e-marketing system is changing. And then finally, yeah, we are in tough times, but there's a lot of opportunity in tough times. And disciplined action trumps speed when there's a crisis think through things so you can tackle it step by step by step. And in doing so, you again need great people. And that's kind of almost where that circle ends. 
and you create great people by connecting teachers and experience with the next generation and that lies our legacy so with this Ms. Uh, may i call you mike again i've done it so many times yeah please mike is good mike is the better one okay well and that's the case my name is daniel my name is not professor i wasn't baptized that way so uh, the key thing is um we've got a job to do and it starts with each one of us it's already started let's just continue the road Thank you very much for all of you being here this afternoon. I've loved this conversation. I've learned so much. And um, may I wish you all a pleasant weekend and a safe weekend. And uh, I hope that we see each other on the road ahead, onwards and upwards. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.